A very good evening to everyone. First off, can I just say how nice it is to see so many friends and family gathered here today to celebrate with the graduates here. But before we begin, just a few announcements. Do remember to turn all your mobile phones and beeping devices to the silent mode and do remain seated throughout the ceremony. So now here's what we will be doing for the program today. First, we will have the opening address delivered by Professor Gerard George, the Dean of Lee Kong Chen School of Business, after which we will have one of our very own graduate representatives make a speech, and we will proceed to the much-awaited presentation of the postgraduate degrees. So for this segment, we do have professional photographers hired, and these photographers take individual close-up shots of each graduate. So we do request parents and friends from coming forward to take photos and remain seated for this segment. And all these photos will be available for download from the photographer's website from the 15th of August. So more information about this can be found on the commencement website. So my next request is actually to the graduates. I know taking selfies is quite a big thing, but could I request you to not take any selfies when on stage? And after you've received your degrees, do head back to your seats and remain seated for the rest of the ceremony. Thank you. So now that we've gotten those announcements out of the way, I think we are ready to get started. So ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the Grand Processional. And gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem. Do take your seats. Good evening, Dean of Lee Kong Chen School of Business, Professor Gerard George, distinguished guests, professors, graduates, friends, and family. A very warm welcome 
to the Lee Kong Chien School of Business Postgraduate Ceremony 2. My name is Angel and I will be your MC this evening. So looking around the room, I know the focus is on the graduates, but this moment would not have been possible without a lot of the people in this room. Firstly, we have the professors and the staff and the faculty in SMU who have helped the graduates throughout this journey. And of course, we have family and loved ones who have supported them through this journey. So from the bottom of our hearts, let's put our hands together and give these people a very warm round of applause. And now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the Dean of Lee Kong Chen School of Business, Professor Gerard George, for his opening address. Professor Jerry, please. Welcome. My name is Jerry George. I'm a professor of innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm also the dean of the business school. Um, Angel started off this evening uh, with saying thank you to your parents, but I thought that was the lamest applause possible. So I'm going to try this again and do it a little bit again. The parents here and your partners have been the greatest strength for you to finish your PhD program or your master's, whichever program you've taken on today, you could not have done it without their support, their money, uh, sometimes their help, <laughs> even in the assignments. So, <laughs> so I want you to give, stop texting your friends, saying he's late, if he's late, he's late, it's okay. So stop texting, FaceTiming, face whatever you do, and then give them the loudest round of applause that you could possibly give. Let's do it. Okay. It's, it's okay. We can do better. So we are going to keep improving as we go along so that it becomes louder and louder, okay? This, this is the rules of this evening's talk. So there are part, two parts to my talk. The first part, whenever I say something nice or something, you have to clap, okay? That, 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 right. I brought my faculty here for my support. So just in case it didn't go as planned, we planted that already. So you've got all of these clappers there to make it doubly easier for you to go really crazy on your clapping, okay? The second part of mine is a take-home message, so you don't need to clap for that. That's a bit serious stuff, right? For the first part, at least, whenever I say nice things about you, your program, and things like that, you have to, like, cat call. You have to, like, woohoo, You have to do all of those things, all right? So keep that in mind. I'm going to start and see how far we go with my speech. To the graduating class of 2018, see, you should have clapped. <laughs> I have to tell you, I don't know, uh, for the parents and partners, I apologize on behalf of all the graduating students. They're really not up to snuff today, but uh, they still have about 30 minutes before I give them the diploma. I still can change my mind. <laughs> there you go. So congratulations. Uh, hey, well, good, good, good. So there, apart from your parents, who we've already thanked, there are other people who are sitting right beside you who've actually helped you through that journey. Uh, sometimes you, you would have thought that uh, they were in great help, but other days you could not have gotten through the day without their help. So to all your colleagues who are graduating alongside you, to all your friends and the network that you're going to continue maintaining throughout your life, say thank you and a big hand for them. All right, now we're getting into the mood. Now you know how this evening is going to go, right? So good. Um, we also have to thank our faculty and our professional staff members. 
You don't see them all the time, uh, but they're always there for you. Um, some of our faculty have been uh, gone over the top in, in terms of supporting you and being behind you and getting you all ready for graduation and getting you through that finish line. Let's give them a round of applause. So LKCSB, the business school, I joined four years ago. The bus business school itself is going through its sense of reinventing itself. We turn 18 uh, about two weeks from now. And when we turn 18, it's also a period of reflection, of renewal, of changing your, looking back at yourself and saying, how have we done? Four years ago when I joined, I couldn't have said this to you convincingly. But today, without a shadow of doubt, I can tell you the business school is a top 50 global business school. Congratulations. I have to say, the business school doesn't do well without its students. It's the students who actually make it happen. So I'm going to give you some examples of students who've done incredibly well in winning global competitions or re redefining themselves. Team Kopanan has done us proud by bringing home the grand prize at the Kellogg Morgan Stanley Sustainable Investing Challenge. The winning team comprises Mao Ying He, Teng Kai Lo, and Felicia Shaw. And the team, the importance of that team was they, they figured out how you can invest sustainably. And in fact, once they won the competition in, um, in the Morgan Stanley competition, Temasek called them to say, we'd like to invest in your fund. So well done to the team. So we've also been, uh, our, our students also go around the world hustling these business plan competitions. I have to tell you, they've done really, really well. Uh, some of our MBA students, and I think they were in the previous batch yesterday, but um, won the North Carolina, what do they call it? North Carolina State Grand Business Challenge in November. And they had to beat out not just students across America, but across the world in about 50 or 60 teams to take that challenge uh, cup. Well done. Our students are not just winners in competitions and, and programs where they go out and test themselves against others, but they've also been stellar at creating entrepreneurial companies. And for me, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship. That's why how I introduce myself. And for me, entrepreneurship is, is one of the noblest activities that we could do because it's not about seeking employment, but about giving employment and it's about creating more with less. And some of our companies, some of our students have created startups that have scaled up brilliantly in this region. Uh, you might have heard of names such as Ninja Van, uh, Shopback, Rebonds, uh, Caro, T-Box. All of these are some of our SMU students. So congratulations to all of them. I'm just queuing you ahead of time, so when I call out your program and say what's good about your program, you have to go really loud, okay? <laughs> Our MQF program, <laughs> ah, good, <laughs> is in its sixth year, and it's fantastic to see that many of the students there are working on startups, we're using financial technologies for, uh, and artificial intelligence technologies that's gonna reshape how we think of structured products in the world. So well done to the MQF team. Our wealth management program. Hey, for your ranking, you should be louder. Try it again. Our wealth management program. All right. Oh, wow. It's really tough pulling these. It's like going to the dentist and pulling teeth and getting them to shout. 
You have to be louder, really loud. They can't even hear you across four rows. So our wealth management program. All right has been recognized for the fourth consecutive year as the top three in the world by the Financial Times. We're the only Asian institution coming after London Business School and Cambridge. I've been in London Business School. I have to tell you, our kids are going to beat their kids anytime soon. Our Masters in Science of Applied Finance. OK, better, better. Volume helps, huh? Good. Our Masters in Science of Applied Finance program is ranked fourth among Asian business schools in the 2018 Financial Times Masters ranking. We've also got some other programs. The reason why I say all of these rankings is because the parents out there said, I put in money in this kid. This degree better be worth something, right? So I'm just convincing them this was value for money, right? So you just play on with this. Uh, uh, apart from those that are here, our exec MBA program ranks 24th in the world. Um, and I have to tell you, we've been improving that program and it's come out in rankings. But it says that our exec MBA students um, are the best paid in Asia. For me, I think um, it's not just the pay, but it's also their fantastic, nicest cohort who are supporting each other. So that's what I'd like to see among all, all our alumni, trying to help them, help others, make sure that they are making progress. So well done to everybody. So our MBA program is ranked 49th in the world and in, in its 10th year now. This is the first time we've ranked that program as well. But in the first time that we've ranked it, when you look at masters and they've put a separate ranking for finance, our MBA is ranked 30th globally and first in Singapore for the top MBAs in finance. There is one indicator that is not always discussed. It's the quality of our faculty. So um, there is a ranking that ranks the research produced by business schools and compares it across the world. It's done by the University of Texas. And when I joined, it was four years ago, that ranking was our faculty were 58th in the world. And we were 14 years old then. Now we are 18 years old, and we are 35th in the world. Uh, you, you know, Singapore, we, we uh, collaborate and compete in a way that, uh, so every three or four months, the business school deans uh, get together. We, we have a meal together, and we talk about our common challenges, uh, some of the opportunities we can work together, and so forth. They canceled it last month. <laughs> and the reason they canceled it is because when our faculty research rankings came, we were first in Singapore. So, so I'm really pleased that we are the youngest school, but with the smartest faculty. We've got some folks here who are graduating with a PhD. There are very few of them, so you may have to help them when I call out their program, because otherwise they'll be only like uh, Havovi and Alan saying, woo -hoo, like two people there, right? So, <laughs> so you need to boost them up a little bit, OK? So our PhD GM and our DBA programs. Uh, all right, we've, <laughs> we've got a few more, good. <laughs> and our postgraduate research, our PhD in research programs. So what we've tried to do in terms of um, leveraging our faculty research is to make sure that we can create two streams. We've created the professional doctorate stream, 
which talks about applied research in a way that is applied, that helps businesses and societies improve using management theories and techniques. And then we have both the postgraduate research programs where we are training traditional PhD students to go in and be academics perhaps, or, or even join consulting companies, but with this idea of more mainstream 26 year old and so forth. And the reason why I say that now is that most of you are master's students, you have a chance at a PhD. So please do come back for that. <laughs> I've got one little bit of boasting. I, 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 I call it branding, but you might call it boasting, but given I'm a dean and it's my podium, I'm gonna call it branding, okay? So at 18, we're the only Singaporean institution that has received accreditation across the American standard, which is ACSB, the European standard, which is ECRIS, and the MBA programs, all our professional programs, and the AMBAR accreditation. That gives us what they call the triple crown, and we've done so with commendations. I'm not a horse racing man, but I'm sure some of you do. So if you won the triple crown, you're pretty good, so I would bet on us, right? All of this, all of this success really belongs to our students and our alumni. Uh, and I'm not kidding about that. Our, our professional staff members have been helping in putting together world-class programs. And our faculty have just been incredible. And I'd go to the bat for them any time. But I think, given how handsome I am, I think uh, some of this success belongs to me. You know, you can't shake your heads and clap out of politeness. You have to mean it when you say, ah, right? <laughs> it's either my faculty and there are some parents that are more supportive than my students. I, I, I have to think about this, giving this diploma today. All right, so let me go to this, um, sort of the takeaway message for today. Yesterday, when we um, had the opening uh, convocation, uh, commencement. We had Minister Heng, uh, Heng Sui Kiat, who was the finance minister, who was talking to us about adaptiveness, that how uh, the important element for us as students is to be adaptive. Our president, Professor Arno de Meyer, talked about lifelong learning and how that fits into adaptiveness. I think there is one piece missing which I will talk about, and that is about purpose. And when we think about that, we try to do several things in this business school. We are experimenting with new technologies, new ways of teaching and learning. We are working harder to be integrated with industry, and many of your programs are successful because of that deep linkage with industry. I'm particularly going to call out uh, MWM, uh, that MWM, yes, yeah, there you go. Francis, Prof. Uh, Francisco. Francis, I think they just like you a little bit. You get, you got less claps than when I faked my, because of my handsomeness. I think they have to try harder, no? Let's give a round for Prof. Francis again. All right. <laughs> so many of our programs are better integrated with industry. And some of our programs are richer because of that integration. And we are trying to do new things and improving that. Our faculty are also trying really hard on research with relevance. Many of our faculty members, and I don't want to call out our names, work incredibly hard and well with industry to make sure that they can take some of their lessons and are able to use it in different parts. Um, I'm going to call out one person, and that's Phil Zirillo. Uh, Phil. <laughs> Phil heads up our Center for Management Practice, and he's been one who's worked with several uh, companies in trying to build case studies 
and worked with the team to, uh, to develop that. And our research program also benefits. So Phil was in charge of our uh, parts of our professional doctorate program. And that spillover is incredibly helpful. Now our research programs benefit from that as well. So the reason why I'm saying all of this is that in this time of what we call artificial intelligence, we have to look really hard at our institutions of natural intelligence and then say, how can we make it vibrant? How can we make it better with research and thought leadership with relevance? Part of that comes from this idea of SMU and how it's designed and its purpose behind it. I serve on this committee in the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, it's tasked with rewriting the corporate governance code. So sometimes that discussion goes like this, is why do we in Singapore have fantastic corporate governance practices and still have some scandals? In other words, you have to ask, why do good people do not so good things sometimes? And to answer that requires a little bit of reflection and a little bit of research that I will share today. There are three foundations, moral foundations, that guide us and that give us purpose. The first one is utilitarianism, utility, right? It's the ethical tradition that dis directs us to decide how to act based on the consequences of our action. That we ought to maximize the overall good and the greatest good for the greatest number. So the idea of profit maximization is based on this utilitarian foundation. And corporate governance systems are designed to fill this uh, mission. Sometimes I think our Kiasu mentality comes from that utilitarianism, that we are trying so hard to get the best out of little bit. And our utility orientation actually restricts us. What happens is this, this emphasis on utility has crowded out two other foundations of morality. It becomes a lens by which utility becomes a lens by which we see the world. I'll give you an example. This morning, I called my grab driver. I was waiting outside my nice little condo. The grab driver passes me, and I'm st standing there waving. Hey, come, come pick me up right in front of him. Passes me, goes by, comes back around. Mine, mine is a narrow street. You can't go very far. Comes back around. Then I'm waving at him. He, he still passes me. And, and then I call him, boss, come here. I'm standing outside. Oh, sir, it's you. All right, comes back. Says, I've been waving at you. Uh, how, how come you didn't pick up? Sir, it says Jerry George. I thought you'll be a white man. <laughs> right? right? So... In many ways, we think of our lens of how we see the world, and it restricts the view of, because we see that people of certain color, certain race, of how we see the world, or the jobs that they do, they act as a lens by which we pigeonhole them into certain categories. Utility crowds out the other two foundations. I'll tell you what the other two foundations are. The second foundation is based on this idea called deontology. I have to read this out for you. Deontology tells us that there are some rules that we ought to follow and duties we ought to do, even if it prevents good outcomes. The fundamental duty, or we call the categorical imperative, is to respect the dignity of each, and each individual human being. Simply put, it highlights the idea that every human being has the right to be respected and treated with dignity. When we glorify, and I'm talking to all your finance folks, let's say investment banking as a role, and say that wealth is, defines your self-worth, what happens is that you crowd out respect and dignity, because you're being utilitarian in how you define yourself. 
the, that's the second foundation. The third foundation of morality is virtue. At SMU, we have this called the circle values. Uh, I'm wondering whether I should try and ask you these circle values. Do you think you'll be able to answer them? Some of them? All right. Circle values starts with commitment, integrity, responsibility. Any more? How about our faculty? Collegiality, there you go. Leadership and excellence. So when we talk about virtue, we talk about some of these values that talks about who we are as individuals rather than what we do. So utility is about what we do, respect and dignity, and virtue is about who we are. This afternoon, uh, I had this session, and uh, there are some kids out there who are temping for us, helping us put all these gowns and things like that. So one of these kids, his name is Farhad, he doesn't know he's in my speech today. Uh, he, he went to the restroom, washed up, took the paper towel, and he did this, tried this three-pointer basketball throw. I don't know about you, for me it never works, for him also it didn't work today, right? So it fell out the side. It fell very close to the uh, bin, so most people would have just walked past. But this kid, nobody else is there, I'm looking at it from the corner of my eye, he doesn't know that I'm looking. He picks it up and puts it in. Virtue is about who you are when nobody's looking. It's not about who you are when everybody's looking. I'm looking handsome today, but that's not me. If you ask my wife, she'll tell that's clearly not you, right? <laughs> that's why we've been married 23 years, yeah. So the three foundations of morality guide us on this path on purpose. In um, about four years ago, 2014, I wrote this article with uh, a cardinal, Cardinal Vincent Nichols. For those of you who don't know, a cardinal is the one who's the head of a Catholic church in a particular region. So uh, Cardinal Vincent is the head of the UK's Catholic church. So Cardinal Vincent and I, when we had written this article, we talked about purpose, where we said that a focus on purpose underscores the interdependence of business and society, and that success in business is intertwined with success in society. So you cannot be a wealthy investment banker or a wealthy finance person, hedge fund manager, and all of these lovely things that focus on utility without being who you are as a person. SMU, I believe, is successful because of its purpose. In 18 years, we've accomplished, I doubt any other university in the world has accomplished. It is a difficult challenge, I say, to remain local while being global. Our parents want global Financial Times, global 50 rankings. But at the same time, they would say, oh, but we want to make sure that all the jobs are here, right? So it is always a challenge in how you manage this. But SMU's North Star is about meaningful impact and impact comes at different levels and at different places. So when we think about our faculty, every day they continue to face a challenge. There's something called tenure and promotion and so forth. Our faculty write articles. Sometimes it's expedient to write narrow articles, perhaps on data that already exists. But it's much more challenging to write articles based on data collected over longer periods of time or with local businesses that help the ecosystem. So that challenge of how do we choose one versus the other, one which is very utilitarian and one that is broader and may redefine who you are as a faculty member and align it with purpose. There are constant battles we fight every day. And for us, purpose has to be a North Star. Last month, I also had a graduation, my second graduation. 
um, they gave me a honorary doctorate in, at the University of St. Gallen. You can clap now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I asked you to clap, not because I feel better for it, but it just wakes up some of the kids at the back. <laughs> hey, first row fellow, enough of taking selfie, man. Listen to me. <laughs> He's still looking at his phone. Knock his head. Yeah, that fell. Yes. You know who you are. When you come this side, I'm not going to give you your diploma or degree. <laughs> so when I was in Switzerland, um, I had uh, uh, gone to this Abbey Library, a uh, fifth century library. Uh, and that library holds some of the medieval uh, scripts in literature, in European literature, which is fantastic. One of those is a manuscript written by St. Gal, after whom the town is named. And he says that there are 12 abuses in life, that you've not lived your life properly if you've not done this. And what he does when he talks about this, he says, you are, you've abused your life if you're an old man without faith. You've abused your life if you're a community without order. You've abused your life if you're a young man without obedience. And I think they use, he uses man because this was fifth century, but women are also included nowadays. He also goes on to say, you've wasted your life if you're a rich man without charity. And he ends by saying, if you're a wise man without good works. Given that I'm in the company of professors and students, my message to you today is to reflect on purpose. Don't let single-handed career aspirations or utilitarianism cloud who you are as a person. Because 20 or 30 years from now, you will look back and reflect that what has def defined you are moments that are not defined by money or by position. What defines you as a person would be deeper inside, one that creates meaning and joy for you. For the graduating students here, here are some simple lessons that have helped me through uh, my own career. Try to be the hardest working person in your team. I would say everybody works hard. Uh, if you're supposed to work nine hours, what I do is I work 10 hours. That marginal hour, I invest in my own growth or in the growth of others around me, right? So I, I say you have to be the hardest working person because you want to invest that extra time every day, every day, that one hour extra to make sure that you are better or the person around you is better. One day may not make a difference. Maybe a week may not make a difference. But I have to tell you, when I look back at my career in 20 years, it makes a massive difference. It's like a pension payout that you could not have done even if you had earned for years together, right? So invest that marginal hour in your own growth, in others around you. And when you feel challenged, you should ask yourself if what you're doing fits your purpose. Before I end, I have to say you are now part of the SMU family. You should clap now. Please stay connected. Join our alumni. Be an active partner. We need each other for our growth and progress. And when you are here, come back and give us a helping hand. In whatever way, if, even if you've got a job in your company, you think somebody from our program might work, might fit. If you've got a lead where some of our researchers might be interested in, something that might help you look better in your company, we are always willing to help. So always reach out, send a note to one of our faculty members and say, hey, Prof, I'm here, I'm not sure if you're interested, it'll be great if we could do something. And what you would find in almost all cases, our faculty members will come back to you and say, wow, what a cool idea, let's see how we can make it work, right? Be our champion. Speak highly of our programs because when you 
speak less of our programs, we also speak less of yourself. Because you're part of this family, we want to make sure that we keep growing. And at 18, what we've accomplished is because of you. In another five years or 10 years, we should be even better, even greater, and with even more firm in our purpose. Let me close by wishing all of us, all of us here, our graduates, our faculty, our staff members, and our students, uh, and our parents, to, when we think about our journey of life, that we will take steps forward imbued with purpose. When we think of utility, we should consciously think that there are two other foundations that I ignore. Utility always beats respect and dignity, and it always beats virtue. So to grow as a person and to grow as who you are, remember that purpose should be your North Star. Good luck. Thank you, Dean Jerry. Every year, a graduate representative is chosen based on his or her outstanding performance both inside and outside the classroom to deliver a speech on behalf of their cohort. And this year, we have a student who has won multiple awards. He has won the Capital Group Most Outstanding Student Award, the Willie really Efficient Learning Award for Top Postgraduate of Lee Kong Chen School of Business, and WMI SMU Prize for Best Graduating Project. So now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome on stage Titus Cao Chin Hui, the graduate of Master of Wealth Management. Titus, please. Good evening, Dean, professors, faculty members, family members and friends, and fellow graduates of this commencement. It is my honor to be able to stand here and deliver the commencement speech on the behalf of the graduating student. Firstly, congratulations to all the graduating students for making it to the end of our postgrad degree. I believe we have all worked hard and put in substantial effort since the day we started on this journey. We also cannot give enough thanks to those who are seated in the middle, our family members, our friends, and our loved ones who have supported us every single step of the way. Shall we give our biggest applause and appreciation to all of them? And to my wife, uh, my family members, thank you. It would not have been possible without your unwavering love and support in the last one year. Thank you. Sometimes our life is like finance. What we could do is to look back at our past performance and try to make sense of it. While we know past performance is not a guarantee of future returns, nevertheless, we still hope whatever observation we have made could perhaps guide us in the later part of our life. For my commencement speech this year, I'll be sharing just a couple of my live observations through a number of short stories which I hope all of us could relate to in one way or another. When I first started Premier One, it was a horrendous period for me. And the reason is because I couldn't speak a single word of English. I remember it was so bad, I even wet my pants once because I can't even ask permission to go to the toilet. It was a terrible time, not only for me, for my mom who seated there, she has to drag a crying child to school every single day. She will often have to stay in school to make sure I'm all right before she leaves. My form teacher, Mrs. Ho, she would do her best to use hand signs like, you know, are you okay? Is everything good? And she would even pat me on the back to make sure I'm all right before she continue on the lessons. Both the ladies have a very common objective of making sure that their persistent outlive my reluctance to stay in school. They know it is one of the situations in life where it does not matter what you do or what you know, but having the greed to stay all the way to the very end. I would like to applaud both of them for making sure I go nowhere but to stay in school. 
degree is basically perseverance and persistence. In my one year in SMU, I recognized the same greed in many of the professors, particularly when the exam paper are handed to them for grading. On a more serious note, as I look back in life, I realized this same principle of greed often sets the winners apart from the rest. In many situations in our life, it is not the first half of the race that determines the winner, but the ending half, where perseverance and persistence becomes the determining factor. The principle of greed requires us to press on when we don't feel like doing so, and to continue even when it's painful or when the odds are, not to are totally not in our favour. I'm indebted from learning and applying this principle at different points of my life, particularly in my journey in SMU. Yeah, thank you for my mom for, for sharing this information. So to all the fellow graduates, as we're all seated here, we have just only completed the SMU race. There's still plenty of race out there waiting for us. And it is how we're going to run all this race using the same principle of greed that will determine our runway in life. In tough times, don't forget to focus on perseverance and persistence. I first met Charles when I was in the basic military camp. He was my buddy in the BMT school, or we call it the basic military training. We were both from the Scorpion Company, and we were both uh, buddies. He was just sleeping next to me. We were both from the Scorpion Company, and Scorpion Company has a reputation in the basic military school for producing the best recruit. We have people who are colonel and general who are used to be from the Scorpion Company. Scorpion Company also has the track record for the best physical fitness, where more than half the recruit will obtain gold in their physical fitness test, the highest standard that one can achieve. Even when Scorpion Company marches past other company, we will stand up for having recruits that are tall, dark, and super fit looking. However, nothing can be further away from the truth for Charles and myself. We were actually fair, slightly overweight, and most importantly, we can't even pass our IPPT. We were literally the white fat horse in the company. Or in the sergeant's term, we are the Fei Zai, if you understand what I mean. It was a demoralizing period for me because I have to stay back in camp every Saturday to carry out additional physical fitness training. I remember it was one of the first few early morning. I was looking at myself, asking myself, how can I not pass the test? Right at this moment of self-pity, Charles came by and all he said to me was five simple words. We can do this, buddy. Later did I expect that a guy can be so long-winded that he's going to repeat this over and over again in the next three months. As cliche as it sounds, even though it's just five simple words, they actually had an effect on me. Slowly but surely, my spirit got lifted and I eventually went on to pass my IPPT. It took us all the way to the last week, to the last physical fitness test, but we did it. I then learned the importance of surrounding myself with positive people who will encourage me when I most need it. Don't underestimate the power of consistent verbal encouragement. Muhammad Ali once said, to be a champion, you must believe you are the best. If you're not the best, pretend you are. He's speaking about mentality here. For me, the biggest cheerleader I have in my life is my wife. She will always be there to encourage me, no matter how bad or bleak the situation is. I also have a band of friends, some of them are seated behind, who will always encourage me whenever I need that dose of positivity. They are honest with me on the situation, but they are always positive on the outcome. As the saying goes, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. As we begin to scale the challenges in our life, our accomplishment will be limited if we decide to do it on our own. Focus on building your team of positive people in your life. In my last module in SMU, it was one of the toughest periods in my life. And it's natural to assume some of my professors seated in the front row and some of my classmates has a part to play. And I can say with certainty, they cannot say they don't have a role after hearing what I just said. Obviously, that is the wrong assumption. The real reason is because 
I lost two of my relatives at the start and beginning of my module, at the middle, sorry, of my module. One battled with cancer for 10 years, and another for six months. While I'm not extremely close to them, it is still natural for me to feel the pain, and obviously, I have attended their funeral. As I sat there at the funeral, it dawned upon me that all of us have a limited time on this earth, and we do not know when the time will come. However, what matters most is not what we have done for ourselves or how long do we have. What matters most is the legacy we choose to leave behind for those around us and the society. As all of us seated here having achieved a milestone in our life, I will urge all of us to have a think about what we could give back to the society. It is a myth that such giving is to be dramatic or elaborated before it can make an impact. While I do agree, we definitely could do more with people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, but I would argue we need people who are more like Mother Teresa. People who are taking small but consistent day-to-day -day contribution and steps to give back to the society. I believe if all of us who are seated here and graduating today could commit at least one way to give back to the society, we can emerge as one of the most impactful postgraduate cohort that SMU has ever produced. Once again, congratulations to all the graduating students for making it to the end of our postgrad degree. I hope all of us can always look back at this chapter of our life with a smile, having pride and feeling proud of what we have achieved in this short period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Titus. We certainly have plenty to be proud of and much to smile for today. And we're going to look at the beaming faces of our graduates in a few moments. But before that, I would like to invite up Dean Jerry as well as our adjunct faculty, Professor Neil Cockbank, for the presentation of the various degrees. So I'd like to invite both of them onto the stage. So first, we're going to have the doctoral degrees. So I'm going to ask their advisor or the director of the program or the person who they would like to walk with to actually go and stand with them. So when they come through, uh, when we give the uh, degree, that uh, it feels like you've walked with them uh, through this journey. Doctor of Business Administration, Harvard V. Hershey Joshi. Doctor of Innovation, Alan McGargle. Doctor of Philosophy in Business Finance, Yat Kin Leong Nelson. Doctor of Philosophy in Business, General Management, Momin Zafar 
up to Majid. Melani Kati Kawati Hariman. Wong Hui Ling, Janice. Yong Xing Ning. Lim Chong Pong. Caroline Lim Xiaoling Doctor of Philosophy in Business Marketing Lim Leon Jin Tan Yi Heng Doctor of Philosophy in Business, Organizational Behavior and Human Resources, Ang Yang Ting. Master of Science in Applied Finance, Garima Malawat. Lao Li Fang Zhang Nan Li Ying Nan Pao Wen Jing Liu Hui Min Zhong Yan Ling Lin Xing Yi, Kenneth. Li De Chen. Go Sin Mont, Glendon. Chan Wing Kai. Wen Chong Ye Li Jia Ni Hu Hai Jing Sun Jiawei Chen Qihang Xi Bohan
张成英。加入的吴思杰，蔡辉放 Amanda， 刘延吉。Lynette Neo Jun Kit Gregory Edward Fuller Tan Bun Ling Rishi, Zhang Jiao, Dong Shenyao, Benjamin. Chua Kai Lun Ding Jin Na O Wen Jin Zhang Yun Xi Xian He Lin Theodore Lee Chi Ken Lee Hai Tian Wang Lie Zhang Wei Dong Yao Shi Liu Huang Bi Rong Li Yu Ting Hendra Maria Rosa Stephanie Wang Shu Xing Chu Ling
绑左。陈雪荣、Robin d i o 之伟、Randy Ronaldo。熊，董佳宁，胡彩。Udaj Tushachi Demba, Shubagi Agarwal, Suriti Malik. Vintion Kritin Chawa Chaudari Yushi Gapta Basam Atta Mina Huja Nira Taka Ashna Shuraj Bohara Abhijay Singh Niharika Singhal Hitesh Sanil Shawa Rahman Shreya Agawa Duo Ting Ting Hani Yuan T. Van Hall Ye Ting Ting Yang Jia Rui Master of Science in Quantitative Finance, Grace Tan. Wang Yi Xing.
và chi hoán Oliver Lance Chu Khu Noya Paolo Olaris Pass Hyo Wan Chun Chutan Pedi Tan Kai Shin Wei Zhong Jonathan Song Lu Fu Peng Lim Donovan Darius Ng Han Liang Nathan Gobal Raja Darius Maximilian Harry Krishnan Gobinadanaya Hua Wenjian Luo Yao Yang Liu Hong Ling Yuan Sha Lu Gao Guo Ya Huang Lu Tai Zi Tiang Li Xing Rong Chai Ming Hong Meng Jie Jia Zhu Jian Hui Yue Lan Yi Shi Tian Lý Mỹ Yue Châu Yi Phang Shen Xia Yang Shi Xian Ren Chen Zhi Shi Chen Zhi Shi 
陈思铎。董国栋、沈义清、杨又廷。天意，王淑梦，刘聪。邓璇、李志超、熊希雅。Shatak Shreya, Lo Zwei Rena, Harishit Padahara. 弗里亚·查卡尔·罗伯蒂、韩诗琪、吴雅琪。崔坎、尹光荣、张信月。燕尾伦 ，Daniel， 贝斯良 ，Jacky， 凯阿拉·温丹。蔡泽芳、林家静、刘刘小玲。瑶瑶。Master of Science in Wealth Management， 肖敬辉
winner of Capital Group Most Outstanding Student Award, Really Efficient Learning Award for Top Postgraduate of Lee Kong Chien School of Business, WMI SMU Prize for Best Graduating Project. Ren Shi. Shi Yi Huan. Liao Xuan Hao. Anirudh Sati Tio Zhi Jie Chen Hui Chen Rimi Gan Jing Zhuo Xuan Jin Michelle Alexis Chan Pui Yi, winner of WSR MISMU Prize for Best Graduating Project, second runner-up, joint winner. He Li Ye. Quintin Nicholas Louis Mears. Three Rams, three Nifasan. Rahil Shalesh Shah. Fang Tian Xiao. Yasumasa Suzuki Yeji Jojai Justin Ng Chun Fong Mari Ranjana Meng Sing Yi Wu Jing Tao Gabriel Anapt Ujjava That's all Thank you Dean Jerry and Professor Neil As this ceremony draws to a close, I would like to thank each and every one of you once again for joining us to celebrate this very special moment for our graduates. But before we graduate, we are going to do something significant as a symbol of your graduation. So I'd like to invite all 2018 graduates to please rise. 
And now you may adjust your tassels from the right to the left to indicate that you have graduated. And things only get more exciting from here because we are going to end with a commencement tradition. And this is something you would have probably seen in hundreds of movies and have been waiting to do in your lives. That is the celebratory toss. So graduates, have your mortar bots at the ready. And on the count of three, we're going to toss them into the air. Are you all ready? You sound a little bit uncertain. Are you all ready? Yeah. All right. So on my count... Ready? One, two, three. Here we go. Congratulations to all graduates. May I request friends and family to remain seated as the graduates and faculty leave the hall. First, I would like to invite Dean Jerry to lead the Grand Recessional. Dean Jerry, please. <laughs> 